All right, welcome back, everybody. We're going to begin the final panel section that we have for this afternoon, uh, dealing with corrections officer and law enforcement personnel um, serving in military capacities. And we have on our panel this afternoon uh, John Forrestal, who is a non-commissioned officer uh, in the U.S. Army, led a military intelligence team um, during Operation Enduring Freedom. His responsibility of his and his team um, was to, as they say, obtain actionable intelligence yeah. from high-value detainees. Uh, John, uh, on top of being a non-commissioned officer, is actually also a lawyer, represents veterans um, in practice in front of uh, the, what used to be the Veterans Administration, it's now been renamed to something else, uh, as well as doing criminal defense work here in Northeast Ohio. Also on the panel, we have Dr. Cynthia Brown, uh, who's a professor, assist assistant professor at the College of Health and Public Affairs at University of Central Florida. Dr. Brown has served on the board of directors for the National Institute of Ethics. Um, she contributes as an instructor and a trainer uh, working with local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies specifically geared towards issues regarding ethics. Um, so we're very happy to have them on the panel this afternoon. Uh, what we're going to do is each of them are going to speak for 15 or 20 minutes or so about their experiences and their take on these issues, and then we'll open it up for a dialogue with the audience. So first John is going to speak, and then Dr. Brown. Thank you, Professor Benza. As Professor Benza said, I'm, I'm actually an alumnus of CASE, CASE Law. Um, I was here on 9-11, right upstairs the morning of when the first plane hit the tower. I was in my wills and trust class as a, a 3L, and I was in the Army Reserves, so within a couple of weeks, my 3L year was done, and I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, getting ready to deploy. Um, after a couple of fits and starts, I ended up in Afghanistan in the summer of 2002. Now, prior to that, my training just to give you a little bit of background, I joined an Army Reserve unit after I graduated from college, and I enlisted. And the reason I enlisted is because this unit was a military intelligence unit, and in the Army, the interrogators are enlisted personnel. They're not officers. And I had a few friends that I went to college with that were in this unit, and instead of going to law school, I decided to spend 67 weeks in Monterey, California, learning Arabic, which was part of the training. So it was. In my mind at the time, it was a pretty good deal. <laughs> it was during the Clinton years, so nobody, you know, there wasn't much going on. I uh, never thought I'd be deployed or anything. So I took the Arabic class, and then I took uh, a basic interrogator class. The interrogator class, you learn how to ask questions, first of all. You learn how to ask what are the interrogatory questions, who, what, when, why, how, who else, why else, where else, why else, and you, and you fully, fully exploit the person you're talking to. Before you can do that, you have to use an approach to get the person to talk. The first approach you use is called a direct approach. What was your mission at your time of capture? That's your first question after you get their name and figure out where they are. Now, if you ask that to an Al-Qaeda person, they're going to tell you, I had no mission. I'm not in Al-Qaeda. In fact, I'm a Christian, which is one guy told me. And he asked for some whiskey to prove it. He said, I'll drink whiskey with you and I'll prove that I'm not an Al-Qaeda. And I said, hey, if we had whiskey, man, I'd get it out and we could drink it, but we didn't. So once you get past that, you need to use approaches to get the person to talk. And these are approaches that people use in everyday life, okay? If you're married and you have kids, you use approaches. If you have a spouse, you use approaches. If you try to return something at a store without a receipt, you're going to use an approach if you're smart. Okay, think about it. If you if you go and say you go into a store and don't have a receipt, if you demand that they take take the, the item back, what's going to happen? They're going to tell you to get lost. You're not respecting them. But if if you if you show them a little bit of respect, you say, you know what? I don't have the receipt. You know, it depends on the store. But if if you show a little compassion, generally you're gonna you're gonna be much more successful. Same thing with your spouse, right? I mean, the women in here know this. Women are excellent interrogators. Because women know how to manipulate men. Men try to use force. Force doesn't work. We used to say you get more bees with honey than vinegar. And that's the basic of interrogation. Interrogation is a way you have to build rapport with the person. You have to get the person to not necessarily trust you, but at least be open to talking to you. Now, if you dehumanize the person you're talking to, as we've done, 
in the war on terror, right? We've dehumanized Muslims and we've dehumanized Arabs and we've conflated Muslims and Arabs together. You know, there's a difference. You can be an Arab and not be a Muslim and you can be a Muslim and not be an Arab. But of course, we, we, most people just conflate the whole thing. And then of course, if you're a Muslim, then you're a terrorist. These are the things that we've been saying and the media has been saying, some of the presidential administrations have been saying since 9-11. And these things affect our mission. If you dehumanize somebody, you're not going to treat them with respect. I have a quote here from a guy. Uh, he's an author, John Dower. He says, if you dehumanize your enemy, you fail to understand him. If you fail to understand him, you won't know what motivates him, what his values are, how he makes decisions. Not knowing those things, you won't know what buttons you have to push to induce him to give up. That's what an interrogation is finding the buttons to push to have them give up. The approaches that we learned were basically based on emotion and on ego. The bigger ones was love of family, love of freedom, hate, hate of, uh, you know, hate of being incarcerated was a big one. You had pride, what we called pride and ego up, pride and ego down. You try to build somebody up, you try to break them down. We had a thing called futility, where you basically tell the person, look, we're going to find out everything already. You might as well tell me, and it, it will reflect better on you when you're officially charged. Of course, in 2002, I was naive enough to think that we were going to charge these people. Um, we didn't have any idea what was going to come. So just to give you an idea, O2 in the summer, we had we got information that we were, they were bringing in a known Al-Qaeda member and that he, he was captured with a satellite phone, with a computer, and with, with um, some other documentation. We, that would, we would call that pocket litter, and that would all be exploited, which means it would be, you know, they would, they would look into the satellite phone, what numbers had been called, what numbers had been received, what information was in it. And he had numbers in his satellite phone that corresponded to known numbers of known Al-Qaeda members. So, this guy came in, and the thought was that he was a suicide bomber and he was active, that he was on a mission when he was captured. So it's sort of like that ticking time bomb scenario that you hear about, right? So, you know, this is early on. I was a young interrogator. For some, for some reason, I was a team leader. And the whole time from 9-11 up until this point, we kept in our training, we're like, well, we, don't, we weren't actually convinced if our methods were going to work either. We bought into this meme that this is a new kind of enemy, that these guys are so committed that they'll never break under standard practices, right? Well, it's not true. So we found out. These guys, this guy, first of all, he wasn't a suicide. The information was bad. He was involved. He was a trainer of the people. He eventually admitted to that. And he, he eventually gave us information that led to the capture or the death of over 35 people. And we got it all through the standard techniques. And what we stressed was we needed to be professional, not emotional. That's what you need. Emotion leads you to do things that aren't legal. Emotion leads to the Abu Ghraib path. Professionalism leads to getting the information. You know? And I had a lot of incentive to be emotional. I had friends who were in the World Trade Center on 9-11. I went to school in New York City. And I had friends who lost a lot of family members on 9-11. And my reserve unit was, had a unit in New York City and a unit in Connecticut. We had New York City policemen, New York City firemen in our unit. We had a lot of people that, were, that lost friends and family members and loved ones on 9-11. But we were thoroughly professional. And we were trained for years beforehand on how to interrogate. So I did an eight-week course. But after that, for the next two years, we spent hundreds and hundreds of hours doing interrogations. We would have actors from New York come in to play. Uh, most of our scenarios were involved around the Kosovo conflict, because this was in the late 90, mid to late 90s. And then we had some that were involved around Al Qaeda, because we, you know, we knew who Al Qaeda was in the late 90s. Might not have been common knowledge of everybody else, but I mean, they did hit the World Trade Center in 93. So they were definitely on the radar. But until we actually started doing the interrogations, there was still that doubt in the back of our mind if, if, if these techniques would work and if we'd have to change them. And one of the things we did 
to help that is we took a course called the Reed Technique of Interrogation. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. It's a technique that law enforcement uses, those law enforcement people who are actually trained in it, not many are. It's a technique that's based on non-coercive interviews, and then you, you figure out, again, the motivation of the person. It's used a lot in what they call the lost profit uh, business. So somebody would, retail stores think somebody stole some money from, the, from a register, or the register was short, or if the safe was missing money, and they have three suspects, you know, there was a man, and there were only three people that had access to the safe, they'll bring in the three people and they interview them. And you ask them these baseline questions to get an idea of their culpability in, in, in the crime. And based on how they answer these questions, you can, you can kind of determine who your suspect is. Like some of the questions, for example, you might ask them, you know, do you know, what, do you know what happened with the safe? And if they, you know, somebody who wasn't involved more than likely would say, yeah, I know, somebody's, there's money missing, somebody stole it. Somebody who was involved would be like, try to distance himself. to say, well, I, I don't know, I, I kind of heard something. I'm not really sure what's going on, All right? And then you ask a question sort of along the lines, well, what do you think should happen to somebody who stole money from the safe? And if somebody says, well, oh, they should be prosecuted, no doubt. Well, that's a pretty good indication that they weren't involved. But if, if they hedge, and they, again, they back up, and they distance themselves, and they say, well, something like, well, maybe they had a good reason to do it. Maybe they, their kid got sick, and they didn't have enough money to pay the doctor that month, and they just needed to, they just needed 200 bucks, and they planned on paying it back next week. Now that when your bells start going off, now we would you would see this again and again. The re technique people use videotapes, and they when they teach you, they have videos of actual interrogations. Now, so when you get to that point, and, and just as an aside, if anybody ever saw the the deposition of Bill Clinton in the Monica Lewinsky thing. His famous quote, this is used in all reputable interrogation classes. He said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Now, there are so many verbal clues in that, in that short sentence. First of all, he said, I did not. He didn't use a contraction, which means there was, there was, there was a forethought. He was thinking of his answer well before that. Because in normal conversation, you say, I didn't have sex with Monica Lewinsky. He said, I did not. He said sexual relations, which is kind of an ambiguous term, right? I mean, and then he said, with that woman, again, distancing himself. He distanced himself from the thing. So you see the same thing in these interviewing processes under the read technique. So let's say you get somebody who's being evasive. Then you separate them out, and you bring them back for what they call a coercive interrogation. And this is where you run the approach. And the approach in this, situ in this example would be you sit them down, and you say, look, we're pretty sure you did it, but we just want to know why you did it. We're not, we're not here to punish you. And then you go into a soliloquy and you talk about, you know what, anybody in your situation, you know, I have a son, if my son was sick and I didn't have health insurance and I'm working this crappy job and they're not paying me that much and I can't afford to pay a doctor, you know what, I would have done the same thing. And you were, it's not like you were stealing it, you are just going to borrow it, right? And you're going to put it back. Anybody in your situation with that. Now you do it, it's much more elaborate and advanced and you, you, you just keep hammering that theme. And, and you watch their nonverbal clues. These are some examples of some nonverbal clues. If the person's sitting back, has their arms crossed. I don't know if you saw in the, the Gilman experiment this morning, the one guy had, when he said, I have lots of choices, and he had his arms crossed. That's pure defiance, like, get away from me. All right, and then once you, you keep building the theme, oh, you, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. Anybody in your situation would have done it. You were in a tough situation. You didn't have the money. They don't pay you enough. They should know better. You don't have health insurance. And then they start coming closer and closer. And once you get them, then you ask them what's called the alternative question. And that's what the whole read technique is based on. And the alternative question here would be, you didn't take that money because you're a thief and a bad person, did you? You did it because you needed to help out your kid and you're going to repay him. Isn't that what happened? And they'll say, yes, that's what happened. Now, in law enforcement, once you get to that point, what needs to happen is then you need to have the person tell you the story exactly what happened in their own words. You gotta say, well, tell me what happened. Where the read technique sometimes gets in trouble is you'll have law enforcement people who can get a false confession because they put so much pressure on somebody and then they use leading questions to get the person to tell the story. Instead of saying, tell me what happened, they'll say, so you took the money out of the drawer, right? Yeah, and you took three 20s and two 10s, isn't that right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's what it was. You know, they, they, they put in and you'll see that there was just a, a special on Frontline about a, a, a case with some false confessions, and the detectives basically walk them through 
the crime. And it came out later that they didn't do it, but they knew all the facts of the crime because during the interrogation that wasn't taped, the detective gave them all the clues. So but basically what I'm saying is these techniques work. And I know they work because my team and I use them to great effect. They take time. You're not going to get it in a couple hours, but you're going to get the information. And Again, it, I think it goes back to being professional over emotion. I mean, we all, after, especially right after 9 11, I mean, it's been 10 years now, and we still can't have adult conversations about it. People want us to torture. They, they want revenge. They want retribution. They want people to be punished. They don't care if torture is illegal. In their minds, a lot of people's minds, I mean, I think the polls are close to 50% of Americans say torture is fine. In their mind, they think it's, it's totally justified. And our dehumanization of, of Muslims and Arabs in this country have led to it to be easier and easier to do. I mean, that's part of what happened at Abu Ghraib. If you read the report, the Taguba report was a review of what happened at Abu Ghraib. The long and short of it was, it was a completely dysfunctional MP unit that was at Abu Ghraib. They were not, they were not trained before they were deployed to Iraq. This is what they found. It said, uh, uh, General Taguba was his name. He wrote, the report was named after him. One of his findings was, I find that prior to its deployment to Iraq for Operation Iraqi Freedom, the 320th MP Battalion and the 372nd MP Company had received no training in detention and turning operations. And when they got there, they received no training. And the report further states, that their SOPs, which are standing operating procedures, is what everybody in the military has. It's like, this is your standard, how you do your job. Those, they were developed by members of the MP units who happened to be civilian corrections officers. So they adopted some of the, the techniques that they used in the civilian world. And, at the, and the chain of command had no training while they were there. And they had people who were, they had instances in Abu Ghraib, before things even got out of hand, of abuse, and the chain of command did nothing to alleviate those. They knew about abuses, and they never stopped and said, we need to train these people correctly. And even to this day, the general who was in charge of the 800th MP unit, her name was General Karpinski, she still denies any responsibility for what happened. And the only people who have been punished are the PFCs and the, pri the privates and the corporals, the people at the bottom. Because again, it's that whole meme that they were the bad apples. They weren't the bad apples. They were put in an impossible situation. They were in a prison that had over 4,000 inmates that was being bombed and shelled every night. They had no training. They were generally around 19, 20 years old. And they're being pressured from above to get information out of people who, frankly, had no information. There was very little intelligence value there. It was a failure of leadership, it was a failure of training, it was a failure of professionalism. And as we heard this morning, the Gilman report, or the Gilman study, it, it, represent, it shows how these things happen. And we knew about that. I mean, I, we studied that in interrogation class. We studied the Stanford experiments, we studied the, the Gilman experiments, and certainly some, some of these, there had to be officers and people at Abu Ghraib that knew about these things, but no safeguards were taken. And yet the people who were punished weren't the people who didn't take the safeguards, it were the people who were pressured into it. They didn't even have the capabilities to, to prevent it. You know, here's another interesting quote. It's, it's from an anonymous CIA officer. He said, the larger problem here, I think, is that this kind of stuff, meaning torture, just makes people feel better, even if it doesn't work. I think that's a huge problem, and we haven't addressed that as a, as a country. We haven't addressed that torture, even if, let's assume, even if it works. I talked to Dr. Reasoner. He said, you know, there's, there's actually some evidence that torture can work. It can be effective. But what are the long-term consequences of it? When you talk to people who are in Iraq, interrogators, they tell you that when the foreign fighters came in, the foreign al-Qaeda fighters, their number one reason for coming were the atrocities at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. It was a recruitment tool, and it's a perpetual recruitment tool because those pictures aren't going away. They'll never go away. They're on the web. They're on all the websites that Al-Qaeda uses and, and all the Al-Qaeda affiliates use. 
Actually, you know, Alberta Mora was the general counsel for the Navy under Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld was just given the uh, Defender of the Constitution Award yesterday, by the way, <laughs> at, at CPAC. Just thought you want to know that. So uh, General Counsel Moore of the Navy, he said, U.S. flag rank officers maintain that the first and second identifiable, cause, identifiable causes of U.S. combat deaths in Iraq, as judged by their effectiveness in recruiting insurgent fighters in, into combat, are, respectively, the symbols of Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. So even let's presuppose that the torture of Abu Zubaydah and the torture of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed led to actionable intelligence, which means it led to information that led to the capture of other al-Qaeda members or led to the disruption of an ongoing uh, mission. Let's suppose that's true. Of course, it's not, but let's, hypothetically. But the long-term effects of that outweigh any short-term, And number, number one. And number two, if you read in the materials, I have three or four articles by Ali Sufin, who was an FBI interrogator. He was the first person to in interrogate Abu Zubaydah, he and his partner. They used non-coercive standard interrogation techniques. And he talked. He was giving them information. But somewhere along the line, somebody above them or somebody in the CIA said, well, he's not giving enough information quickly enough. We need to take the gloves off, right, that phrase. And the, and the CIA came in, and they started abusing Abu Zubaydah or, you know, torturing him. And Ali Sufan, to his credit, contacted his supervisor back in Virginia and said, hey, I'm not comfortable with, these guys, with what these guys are doing. We have to put a stop to it. And the FBI tried to put a stop to it. They couldn't. They pulled them out. The FBI in 2002 pulled, pulled FBI agents out of the Zubeda interrogations. Now, why would they do that? Well, number one, the FBI trains their people in interrogation. They had the same training I have. The CIA were not trained in interrogation. They just winged it. Which brings me to the whole SEER thing. How, how did this all happen? We heard a couple people mention SEER. Just want to let you know what SEER stands for. It's survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. It was designed for Navy and Air Force pilots. The thought was in the Korean War, if they were shot down and captured, they were going to be captured and tortured by the Chinese and the North Koreans. So. They created the school in the 50s. And somebody uh, mentioned this morning that it was only in the 1950s. No, it, it, that school has been around since the 50s up until the present day. Okay, and so the first thing is if you get shot down or you, get, you survive, you parachute out, you get on the ground, and you fight to get away. If you get captured, then you evade capture, survive, evade, if you can evade capture. If you get captured, you resist the interrogation. And if you can't resist or while you're captured, you have a duty to escape. So, and that's, they, they train you. And the, and the training was, we're going to use, other than this, you know, there's survival training, there was evasion training, there was escape training, but the resistance training is, is what's pertinent here. The resistance training was using the torture techniques that the Chinese would use on them to, to give them an idea um, mentally to sort of prepare them for this is what's going to happen. Included in that was waterboarding. Okay, I don't know how effective, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know if it would be effective if you knew ahead of time what they were going to do to you. I think it would still be a pretty horrible experience. Now, here's the Armed Services Committee. Uh, Senator Levin chaired uh, an investigation into the abuses at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and how all this happened. And this is what they found. This is what they say about SEER training. SEER training is based on illegal exploitation of prisoners over the last 40 years. The techniques used in SEER school, based in part on Chinese communist techniques used during the Korean War to elicit false confessions, include stripping students of their clothing, placing them in stress positions, putting hoods over their head, disrupting their sleep, treating them like animals, subjecting them to loud music and flashing lights, exposing them to extreme temperatures. It also includes a face and body slaps, and until recently for some who attended a Navy SEER school, it included waterboarding. So it's the whole list of the things that Rumsfeld approved, right? What they called the enhanced, enhanced interrogation techniques, or what a normal person would call torture. But the key thing is, it was designed to elicit false confessions. It was a propaganda tool. The communists, they wanted to capture Americans, torture them, and get them to admit things like, oh yeah, we, we killed and 
boiled and ate Chinese babies or North Korean babies. That's what we did. And they put them on TV. That's what it was designed for. It was a propaganda tool. It wasn't designed as a way to elicit truthful information. And somehow, in our infinite wisdom, after 9-11, we decided that the normal techniques for interrogation wouldn't work. Now, who decided this? Nobody, no interrogator decided this. Ali Sufan certainly didn't decide this, the FBI guy, interrogator, with all the experience. Nobody asked me or any people I know. They went and found these psychologists, psychiatrists from the Sear School and General Miller, who was involved with the Sear School, and they said, this is what we got to do. We got to use these techniques that were designed to elicit false in, in, confessions. I mean, it's ludicrous. It, make, it makes absolutely no sense. And it's not like they weren't warned. There's some emails from June 2004 that Sear, a Sear psychologist warned the Pentagon officials. He said, we really need to stress the difference between what instructors do at Sear school, which is to increase resistance capability in students, versus what is taught at interrogator school, interrogation school, which is to gather information. What is done by Sear instructors is by definition ineffective interrogator conduct. Simply stated, Sear school does not train you on how to interrogate, and things you learn, in quotes, there by osmosis about interrogation are probably wrong if copied by interrogators. So what happened was, we had people who, at Sear school, there are people who play interrogators. They're what we call OP4, operational forces. So they play the Chinese or the North Korean interrogators. We took those people and flew them to Gitmo, and eventually flew them to Abu Ghraib, and they instructed interrogators on these techniques. Now, these interrogators they instructed, almost all of them were not trained interrogators because we didn't have enough. Once we decided to invade Iraq, we didn't have enough people to be in Afghanistan and in Gitmo <coughs> and in Iraq. So what happened was anybody that had, if they were an analyst, an intelligence analyst whose job is to get reports from the interrogators, and from signal intelligence. They get the reports and they analyze the information. Also, they become interrogators. CI people, counterintelligence people, they become interrogators. The CIA did the same thing. All their people became interrogators. No training. None. Until they bring the Sears guy. Then they bring these Sears guys. And so there's nobody there to say, wait a minute, this training is bogus. Your premise is bogus. Your training is bogus. This doesn't work. So that's how it, a lot of this started. And it sounds, it sounds like something out of like a, like, you know, a bad novel, right? But this is what happened. So the combination of dehumanizing, looking for revenge, having the seer instructors portrayed as legitimate instructors of interrogation, incompetent command structures at Abu Ghraib, administrative officials making decisions based on fear or retribution or just plain ignorance or ideology. I mean, this stuff started all at the top. And to date, the only people who have been punished have been 20, 21-year-old, 20 22-year-old kids. So I take this very personally, I think, because you know, I, I took great pride in what I did. And then I come home and people are like, well, you know, you, you get accused of being like somebody, you know, people think you're making naked pyramids of, of people covered in feces. I mean, it's ridiculous. But it's not just, that, it's not just my personal pride that's in, in line. There are, there are real world consequences. You know, I know some of the other speakers mentioned that there, were, there was a lot of guilt with, with professionals who were involved in these things. And that's all well and good. But you know what? People died because of this. U.S. soldiers died because of this. And there will be attacks probably because of these things. We, the, the policies that we implemented that led to this has increased the recruitment of al-Qaeda. That's without a question. And the perception, you know, al-Qaeda used to recruit, you know, bin Laden's big line, and you would hear it a lot, was like, well, the Americans are the white devil. Americans hate all Muslims. Americans want Muslims to go away. Right? And you see what's going on in Egypt. I don't know if you heard, if everybody's heard Mubarak has resigned. Right? But why was Mubarak in power for 30 years? 
you disagree. We supported Mubarak. Now you can't say, and the people, you know, when you say that, people get mad. But it's true. The number two in Al-Qaeda is, is the, the Wahari, the al-Dabib. He's a doctor, right? He was in Egyptian jails for years. He tried to assassinate Sadat. He was involved in the plots. He's a bad guy, obviously. Bin Laden and he got together. When they first formed al-Qaeda, Zawahiri was in a, a group called the Egyptian Jihad. Their, their stated goal was to overthrow the government of Egypt and to establish an Islamic government. Bin Laden's stated goal, he wanted to overthrow the royal family of Saudi Arabia and establish an Islamic government. They went down to Sudan. They were seeking refuge down there. And then they were convinced when they got together, like, you know what? Even if, if we take out the, you know, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, he's just going to be replaced by another prince. You know, if we take out Mubarak, he's just going to be replaced by another strongman. And they're both supported by the United States. We need to take out the United States. That's, what the, that's when they started, when, when bin Laden in the late 80s decided, we're going to go after the United States. Now, this is, this is the reality. This is, not, this is not saying that what they did on 9-11 was justified. It certainly wasn't. But in order to, to effectively fight them, in order to be a good interrogator, you have to deal with the reality of the situation. You have to understand your enemy. But if we're just going to say, well, these guys are just pure evil, and there's nothing we can do, we just have to torture them. First of all, we're not going to get the information we need. We're not going to fight them effectively. And we're just going to lead to better recruitment because we're buying in to their propaganda that says America wants to kill us all, America is the white devil, America is the worst government on the face of the earth. And anything we do that validates that argument hurts us. So I know I didn't really talk about uh, divided loyalties too much. Um, Professor Brown's going to talk more about that. Cause, but I just wanted to give a, sort of a context to what happened and what some of the consequences of that are. And once, I don't know what the solution is, because, I mean, once the Abu Ghraib pictures came out, right, it's, they just came out of the box, there's nothing you can do to ever put it back. So, but I'll be interested in answering any questions you have when we're done. Thank you. Professor Benza, thank you very much. I'm honored to be here and be a part of, of this symposium. I'm going to talk a few minutes about the divided loyalties and where law enforcement fits. And we're, we're looking at both military police and, and civilian law enforcement. My experience, unfortunately, is not as much on the military side, but more so on the civilian domestic side. And uh, of more recent years, the effects that the war on terror is having on our civilian law enforcement, particularly with veterans coming back and either um, Prior to uh, joining the war effort, they served as law enforcement, or after coming back, they're recruited for local law enforcement. And so I will talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that I've experienced and seen in that realm. But to begin with, John and I were, were having some discussions about what is the conflict of interest? What is the divided loyalty of law enforcement? And initially, we both approached it from the same perspective, and we were saying, well, you know, there's not really a conflict of interest if we look at the code of ethics. If we simply take this from the perspective of what is the role of law enforcement, and again, whether we're talking about military police or our domestic uh, law enforcement agencies, is there a divided loyalty? Is there a conflict of interest? And, and again, from the perspective of the code of ethics, there's not. The code of ethics that, that governs military police and the code of ethics that governs local law enforcement, while not identical in wording, is essentially the same. The message is the same. So in that respect, our military police and our local law enforcement share the same code of ethics. And there is a very clear, unambiguous, uh, at least to me, code of ethics that guide these officers or should guide these officers. So where does the divided loyalty or the conflict come into play? And ultimately, I think um, it comes into play because we have a divided message for our law enforcement. Since 9-11, law enforcement is tasked with sort of a dual focus. Not only do they have to maintain the traditional law enforcement role of you know, fighting the bad guys on the streets. But now today, we're also putting law enforcement 
um, officers in the position of national security officers. They actually have a very enhanced role in helping us fight terror here at home domestically. And it's a very clear message. I had uh, a couple of really um, good quotes, again, from Rumsfeld, who seems to be the guy of the day, um, who was actually tasking our local law enforcement with the role of becoming sort of our uh, protectors of national security on the street. And I would say from 2002, um, even up until the most recent grant announcements, uh, a lot of the federal funding, if not the majority of the, I mean, not uh, all of the federal funding that law enforcement agencies locally could apply for and compete for was all based on what their plan was to further national security. So if they needed new um, vehicles, then they had to demonstrate how these new vehicles were going to enhance national security. If they needed new weapons, they were going to have to demonstrate how the new weapons were going to further national security. It wasn't as much anymore about fighting crime on the streets as it was national security. So we have law enforcement officers who have um, historically had issues, and whether we're talking about corrections officers or, or our patrol officers, there's historically been ethical issues that we have faced. And um, the National Institute of Ethics has been involved for at least a decade, studying why do police officers make poor decisions? What is it that would lead a police officer to do something that we would consider to be unethical or uh, not in compliance with the code of ethics? And by far, um, up until recently, the leading factor that will lead a police officer, according to, to the studies that have been done by the National Institute of Ethics, the leading cause are things like favoritism in the department. Uh, they feel like they were mistreated or didn't get something that they should have gotten. And so they, they react to that and act out. But more recently, what we're seeing is the competing values of what it is to be a crime fighter on the street versus national security. And it plays into what John was saying with emotions leading over professionalism. And because there is such a push and there is such discussion at the local ranks for national security and looking for the terrorists that are in your own backyard, that there is a heightened sense of fear among our police officers. And this fear is, is translated into emotional reactions to situation, for the most part, that that lead officers to making very poor decisions. Uh, another component component of it potentially is the fact that the constraints and protocols and procedures associated with national security are much relaxed as compared to the criminal procedures of typical traditional crime fighting. And so the, the second component of why we may be seeing unethical behavior from police officers is the fact that if they want to skirt protocol, if they can somehow phrase whatever it is they're doing under the national security umbrella, then they are able to um, enjoy the less restrictive procedures and protocols. And, and they are quite lenient in some regards. Uh, the same constitutional protections that most of us enjoy in terms of criminal procedure don't necessarily exist if we're talking about something that's potentially a national threat and falls under the national security um, vein. And so for that reason, I think that's, that's kind of a dual explanation for the majority of the things that we're seeing in local law enforcement today. One of the things that concerns me as a, as a thought of this is we're hearing a lot of discussion, and it, was, it came up today, about this is a new war. This is a new kind of war, and we have to fight it differently. And that, I think, has been um, speak for we can relax some of the ethics codes. We can relax some of the things that we know we ought to do because, well, this is a new war, and we really have to fight it in a new way, and we just can't do it the same way that we've been doing it. But if we, if we look historically at what has governed uh, war for centuries, 
hundreds and hundreds of years. It's, it's been the just war theory or the just war uh, concept. And that essentially has a number of components, but essentially it says that, first of all, the, uh, the intent behind the war, and I guess we should start with what is war, and it is, it is a military um, action by a, a, a political organization for a political purpose. So in the just war context, that military action has to be begun from a, from a just intent. There has to be a, a justification that is, is noble. And whatever is adopted, whatever means is adopted in that war, then it, it must be something that when it's over, the good that is caused by it outweighs the harm that was done by it. Secondly, there is a component of just war theory that suggests that we also have to have proportionality and discrimination. And that means, again, that um, the effort expended and the harm done outweighs, I mean, is outweighed by the good that we actually accomplish, and that we do so by discriminating against or with the harm that we're causing so that we are making a concerted effort not to engage and not to harm non-combatants. And so part of the, the justification or the, the reason I think that some proponents say that we are in a new kind of war is because we're fighting enemies in the form of terrorists who are not uh, complying with just war theory. And we are, not, we are not facing the traditional enemy in the context of we're not on a battlefield. We can't see them across the way. We're not using bows and arrows and long guns and the traditional weapons. And we are facing an enemy who is targeting noncombatants. In, in the case of the United States, we're combating Americans, noncombatant Americans. And they're harming Americans because that is a the ideal of terrorism, and it is a way that they can instill fear and they can further their political agenda. And so the administration, I think, is suggesting that this is a new war, a new type of war, because the enemy's different. The enemy has taken a new approach. And my, my thought for you today is, you know, first of all, just because our enemy is taking a new approach, does that mean that our approach to war must be different? And if it is, then my second thought would be, are we misdefining our enemy? Is terrorism, is it an act of war, or is it criminal? Now, crime on a major scale, um, a major organized form of crime, but, but are we talking about an act of war, or are we talking about criminal behavior? Historically, at least until 9-11, in the United States, we treat it as a crime. But after 9-11, it is now an act of war. And that contributes also to the confusion that we have at the local law enforcement um, level, because we have local law enforcement officers who are told on one hand that they are indeed fighting um, the war on terror. And on the other hand, we're giving them typical crime-fighting tools to arrest these guys. And we've had great success at the local level um, looking at things like uh, where money is flowing to and from and, and combating where the source of the money is or are they selling drugs and, you know, is it sort of what we would consider typical law enforcement roles have done a very good job of ousting some terrorist-type activities through the traditional crime-fighting role. And if it is some blended component of that, if the definition of terrorism from our perspective of fighting it is some combination of these two, then perhaps one of the things we need to do as a nation is look at the rules because we're trying to apply both. We're, we're sort of throwing everything we can at this particular new enemy and it is sending different messages and the standards are different. And does that mean that if a local law enforcement officer uses national security means to thwart someone on the street, it may fall, um, depending on what occurred, it could fall under a violation of the ethics code. But if it's criminal behavior that we're fighting, then 
depending on how you apply it, it may not. And so I think, I think we have some fundamental issues that we need to address as a nation and that we need to look at. And one of them I would suggest to you is defining how we're going to approach terrorism and if we need to look at a new definition, not necessarily treat it as a new kind of war. Um, I, I want to make sure, we've been asked to make sure to leave time for questions, thinking that this may be a very active question session, but um, I'm going to, I, I think I'll, I'll leave you with that, and then if we have some time, I'll, I'll finish my thoughts, but just to make sure that we have some time for questions, we'll open it up now. Uh, Bruce Wick, uh, Fairview Park, Ohio. I'll, I'll grant you that the initial cadre of torturers, if you will, uh, were untrained and uh, Ill, Ill experienced. But that itself suggests that information may not have been the goal. The question arose earlier, what, uh, how has Mubarak maintained himself in power for 30 years? Well, torture is one of the answers, mm -hmm. and torture is a, is a tool of terror. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter who one tortures, who one grabs off the street, uh, but if the goal is to terrorize the population and to submission and to break up combinations that might oppose the regime and its continued rule. And I'd like, uh, I'd like your thoughts that, that perhaps uh, terror rather than information uh, was the goal of all this. The goal of? torture from from the administrative point of view from the our side yes oh mm. possible i mean with some of the people who were involved possibly but I, I i i think it was more just they were misguided um i think they were you know talking about cheney and rumsfeld specifically i think you know, even just the buildup of the war, any, anyone who ever gave them information that didn't couch with their worldview was ignored. So, for instance, after, on 9-12, the day after 9-11, if you, if you read about some of the meetings that they had with the principals, they were pushing towards invading Iraq then, before they had any information about what was going on. And as the buildup of the Iraq war went on, whenever they got information from the intelligence agencies, and the CIA was screaming at them, you know, there's no connection between al-Qaeda and Saddam. And Saddam doesn't have any weapons. I mean, he might have biological or chemical weapons, but he doesn't have any nuclear weapons. Of course, they always conflated all those into weapons of mass destruction. But I, th I, think, I think they actually were sincere in their thought that torture would have gotten it would get information. And I think they believed these seer people that torture was the way to go. Because I know from my experience and talking to other people who were interrogators, we, there was a lot of pressure from up high saying, you guys got to get more information and you have to get it more quickly. And they didn't rely, they, they, had, they had no faith in the standard practices. And if we, if somebody interrogated someone who they thought was involved in X, and we came back and said, well, you know what, we don't think he's involved in X. They said, well, you got to get, you got to go back. They, they, they had all these preconceived notions about things, and if you didn't come back with information that validated their preconceived notions, they just igno dismissed it out of hand. I think you saw that pattern with, with the way that we treated detainees, with the designation of illegal combatants, which they created out of thin air. Right, to, so that we could not have to abide by the Geneva Conventions in Afghanistan, and we could then create Gitmo, because they created Git, Gitmo was an island, obviously, but it was also a, a legal island. They created that purposely so that these people wouldn't come in, into federal jurisdiction if we brought them into the United States, and they also wouldn't fall into Geneva Conventions protections. That's why they created the illegal combatants. Now, on my side of things. The people I worked with, we decided that since we were trained under the auspices of the Geneva Conventions, and since our approaches were legal under Geneva Conventions, that we weren't going to change anything. We were just going to treat the detainees like we would normally. That's what we did. So, but I, 
you know, I'm not fans of Cheney and Rumsfeld, but I don't think the torture was designed just to torture. I think they actually had good intentions, but they were completely misinformed. What are you? Well, I don't know that I could speak to torture, but I, I have done um, some research at least uh, with regard to the messages that the administration, Bush administration in particular, was sending to Americans through a variety of sources. And I think that there is an argument to make if we define terrorism as using fear to instill some type of action towards political, uh, for political motive, I think there's definitely an argument that can be made that the Bush administration um, or various aspects of the administration used the tool of fear to further uh, political, their political. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have um, a comment about the Siri, uh, uh, history of Siri in the military, and then a question for you both about law enforcement. Just on this, um, I was at the Air Force Academy in the early 90s teaching when the huge scandal broke because of the particular way in which that training was taking place at the Air Force Academy, where prior to the time when these scandals broke, every cadet actually had to go through this training. And it, um, regardless of whether they would have a flying career, where they would be subject to the sort <coughs> of interrogation methods that the training was intended to prepare them for. And in fact, if they were to fly, they would later go to a, a more professionalized version of the training um, at, in Washington State, actually. But uh, the problem at the Air Force Academy in the 90s was a suit um, brought by a cadet who, uh, who left the academy um, with serious mental health uh, problems after going through that training, where he was subjected to sexualized torture, simulated rape, um, if that's in fact a reasonable phrase to use for it. Um, other kinds of sexual torture were practiced against him by other cadets in the course of this training. And the training was run by other Air Force Academy cadets with all the experience that a few years at the Air Force Academy would give them in how to manage these kinds of things. And I, I just, the reason I mention that is because I think part of the problem here is that we haven't paid enough attention as a nation um, to the trauma that we've inflicted on our service members to understand how that might affect our policies going forward. Because I think if we had, I actually think, um, and this goes to the sort of the ulterior motives that might consciously or not influence senior policymakers and decisions. Um, one of the things that the Siri training did was elicit a tremendous outpouring of gratitude and patriotism when the camps in which the cadets who were in the training were held were liberated um, by the other cadet teams who came in to liberate them. And in fact, that's what the cadets who had been through the training regretted the most about the end of that training for every cadet, because they thought the other cadets wouldn't have that experience of gratitude and for their country and what they termed patriotism um, because of that sort of rescue that happened th at the end of that training. So I think that the way in which our service members, maybe our chaplains, are um, vicariously traumatized. Um, I think that there's, if we paid more attention to what was happening to our service members, we would have more rational policies going forward. But to the point here and law enforcement, I have an ethical question for you about law enforcement, and you both know a lot more about this than most of us do. Um, I th I've always thought that the blue wall of silence is a big problem for understanding misconduct and actually ethical considerations. So how have you seen that operate in, uh, in the context in which you've worked? Go ahead. Um, Yes, the code of silence, the thin blue line, uh, is, is very problematic. Uh, it's been problematic for a long time. It's not new with 9-11. It's been something that has been very difficult to study just because of the very nature of it. I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, what Beth is talking about, but the code of silence or the thin blue line refers to the uh, connection that law enforcement officers have with each other and the, the informal code to protect each other. And when that code is used um, ethically, of course there's no problem with it. But where we have a problem with the thin blue line or the code of silence is when it's used to cover up something. You know, when um, a partner knows that another partner is taking money that he shouldn't be taking and doesn't speak up about it, and that's where we see a problem. I can tell you there have been a number of efforts by NIE to actually study it, and, and part of the problem we have had is the fact that there is a code of silence in a thin blue line. So, so what we're trying to uncover, no one's willing to talk about, and so it's very difficult. There are a few studies out there. Um, there, there actually is one this decade. Most of them that exist 
um, are much, much older. Uh, the Serpico era, there was a lot of stuff after Serpico, and so there were efforts then, and, and there were some open discussions about it. And Serpico is alive and well, I'm happy to say, and is out there working, trying to help with this. But um, it, it's, it's difficult. But there is a, a study, I, I want to say it was 2004, 2005, that was done by, I think it's the University of South Florida, um, where they, they were able to get some local law enforcement officers in Florida to open up a little bit. But there's not much out there. Does it exist? Yes. And what's interesting is we're seeing a spillover. Now there's the thin red line. Anybody want to guess? Firemen. Okay, the thin red line. There's a thin green line, a, three, a, three, uh, a thin yellow line. So we're beginning to see this uh, code of protecting your brothers and sisters um, sort of moving beyond law enforcement into <coughs> other professions. But uh, it's, it's, there's been a great expansion in, in the fire, uh, among firefighters. But, yeah, the thin blue line is there. You know, I don't know if it exists as much in the military, but I would tell you this. After what happened at Abu Ghraib, because it was soldiers who first reported the incidents at Abu Ghraib, there were a couple low-ranking soldiers who, who, took, who found the pictures and who reported it up the chain, some chain of command, and it finally was addressed. And you know, hopefully it was remedied <coughs> going forward. But if you're a young soldier or, or a junior enlisted person and you see these kind of things and you see what, the conse what were the consequences of Abu Ghraib again? Only the junior enlisted people were punished. So I think that's a big disincentive to, to come forward, if you're, if, especially if you're a junior enlisted person, if, if the people who were ultimately responsible or the people who could have prevented it were not punished. And actually, most of them were, were promoted. And there was just an article yesterday, an AP article, about the CIA people who were involved in a lot of these torture sessions and indecisions. Most of them are, that are still in the CIA have been promoted. Well, I think there, there's another another component to it too, and, and the reason it survives and thrives is the nature of what these men and women do. And if you end up deciding that you want to come forward and, and speak up about something that you see that is wrong, then who's going to watch your back? You know. And so when you're on that call and there's somebody shooting at you, is there going to be anybody there to back you up and shoot back? And so there's the fear that well, it may be wrong, but if I do say anything, I may be in, in very bad trouble if I need these guys. So it keeps the, the, the bond there when, when it doesn't need to be there. I'm, I've been thinking a lot about your question of if the enemy is different, do we have to change? That seems to me to be, that's been the justification for changing our tactics in the war on terror. It was probably the justification in the 50s with communism to change our tactics of, uh, of constitutional guarantees back then. And it seems to me such a false question. If it, just because the enemy has changed, do we then give up our ethics and our standards and our beliefs? Um, it, it, it's so absurd on its face that it makes me as a psychoanalyst think psychoanalytically that what we've done is we've found a mechanism through which we can justify our worst impulses situationally and express them by claiming that they are done by the enemy. I mean, it's a, you know like little kids, you know, it's not me, it's you. Yes. Um, but but that, that's, that process is a very intriguing one. And I also was thinking about the idea of terrorism being the uh, purposeful, uh, first of all, using fear and second, uh, targeting civilians. And I just read a statistic that uh, in World War I, 95% of the casualties were military. In World War II, only 50%. And both sides targeted civilian populations. We certainly did and changed that. Um, and so the, the, the ethics of warfare you know, has been changed and we've been questionable, but we like to justify it by first claiming our enemies doing it and that justifies our doing it. And that whole idea has to be challenged across the board. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. How do we do that? Um, how do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it does go back to some of the same things that have been said today. There has to be transparency. There has to be accountability. We have to start, um, I, at least I, I can speak to this from, uh, from the law enforcement perspective. We need a change in the culture. 
We need a culture that says this is wrong and we believe it's wrong and we're not going to stand for it in, instead of something the opposite of. And, and I think it's going to start with each of us. And I, I can't remember now, unfortunately, um, but somebody this morning was talking about uh, sort of a, the, the joke about I don't know and I don't care. And, and we've got to wake up. I mean, we as Americans have to wake up, and we have to, we have to start learning, and we have to start caring. Maybe we have to start caring first, and then we have to start, start learning. But everybody seems to be so, um, I hate to say self-absorbed, but, but so self-absorbed and, and into what is urgent and important in their lives at that moment. And a lot of things are happening out there that I think really do require our attention. And the sooner we give it some attention, the sooner we may be able to see some change. Um, uh, once again, I'm not really sure what I'm going to say here. Um, and I don't have a PowerPoint, so it's really, really a problem. But I'm, trying to, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think about this question, what do we do? And you know, one is to get that webcast out there and um, let people hear, hear these stories. Uh, but of course, that's, that won't happen. I mean, it'll go out. But <laughs> yeah. Um, I also, I, th I think it's striking that um, academia has tried to deal with some of the ethical issues posed by experiments like, uh, like Milgram's and, um, and Bardo's, although I don't know that those were really motivating, uh, th those were key. I think we associate those experiments as part of what led to human subjects committees and so forth. Um, so one thing that occurred to me as I think about things that might be done uh, is that yeah, interrogators, uh, ought to, this ought to be viewed as a, like a human subjects experiment. Uh, and there ought to be, if they're going, if, uh, th there ought to be some independent board that is making a judgment about, uh, about the ethics of the practices um, that are going to be engaged in. And this, of course, requires all kinds of things that we, we've just been complaining we don't have, including a level of transparency and a willingness to have someone look at our, um, at, our, at our problems. But as someone, it may have been Beth, was saying earlier, I mean, the, the silver lining behind the shocking images that have brought, made the salient to us is also an opportunity. This is the, this is the crisis that, might, that, that shouldn't go unexploited um, and to take advantage of it. Um, uh, so something along those lines. And I guess connected to that is, um, is the idea that I am pretty sure that Rumsfeld and Cheney and others would, would hear the Milgram experiment and say, that was an unethical thing that Milgram did. Really, really unethical. Um, and uh, yet I hear him interviewed, I'm sure, in his book, which I haven't had yet the pleasure of reading. Um, uh, he doesn't feel any ethical uh, violation is connected to him, that he's clean of it. And I've heard, uh, I've heard the lawyers involved uh, uh, say things like they have no trouble sleeping at night, you know, that this is, this is all good. Um, so there, you know, one thing is to promote this idea that we're not who we think we are and to use things like Milgram as an opportunity and uh, also to build institutions that, that are serious about, um, about adding ethics that are somewhat independent into this process somewhere. And one of the issues that comes up a lot, and I wonder if you might speak to this, um, is the failure of communication. The, the fact that in a lot of these stories there is someone who believes there is something wrong, who wants to tell someone, it may be in the form of a, of a wrenching suicide note, uh, but it, it may be in the form of someone who says nothing but feels it and feels frustrated because it's, it's futile, it's not gonna make any, any difference. Um, and it seems to me there should be institutions to, uh, that, we, that we build into them, or mechanisms, say with the internet, that we can use to, to um, improve uh, information flow of this sort and, and let the consequences be what they might. I think that on the whole, uh, we will be better off if this information comes out. And of course, you know, we should protect whistleblowers and so forth, but there's just information there that isn't being exploited, and maybe maybe you thought about that. I'm done, thanks. I, I do have a couple of thoughts. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, I'm gonna start, at, I think, at the end. You may have to remind me of some of the things, but when you said that, one of the thoughts that comes to mind is, um, you know, with the new phones now, most of them have cameras and video cameras. And so there's been a, a big issue of late with 
uh, citizens uh, witnessing police officers in action in questionable circumstances, or at least that's what I'm hearing. I'm sure they're w also witnessing uh, situations that are not questionable, but at least in some questionable situations, and they're recording it, mm -hmm. and they're posting it on YouTube, and they're making it available for viewing, and there has been some education of sorts for people who are watching it and some outrage by people. And so what does Illinois do? Illinois now outlawed, I think it's, it may, I think it's the state, it may be Chicago, um, but there is a law now in the state of Chicago, I mean state of Illinois, that um, outlaws citizens filming police officers in action and posting those. So, so the transparency thing that we were talking about, well, we need to talk to some politicians because that, that right there was, it, when I heard that, it was a wow. You've got to be kidding me. This is exactly what we need to wake people up, and we're going to shut it down. And there were, th there were three other locations that followed. Um, Illinois was first, and then there, there have been three locations since that have followed and have outlawed citizens filming officers in the line of duty so that if there is something questionable that they're not questioned. You know, let's keep it under wraps. And so I think you're right. I think we have to figure out some way to address that and, and, and educate and make it more transparent so that people are held accountable. And with regard to the communication, um, I'll take a second and give you an example of something related to communication, and it relates to veterans coming back. I was asked to um, help a particular municipality with uh, a very problematic police department. And there were lots of issues, I mean, lots, lots of, of um, accusations of ethical violations of many officers within a, a small to mid-size uh, police force, under 200 officers. And I spent a great deal of time with the officers in the ranks and interviewing and trying to break that code of silence to figure out what's going on. And at the root of it, after months and months of investigating and interviewing, what came to light was there was a group of about six officers who had been reservists, who had um, served, come back to the states, became police officers, and were applying the techniques that they had learned as soldiers in the ranks of the police department. And there were citizens who were being abused, there was profiling of many types going on, and it was just adding on. And so what happened is they became a great force in that police department and they were spreading their unethical practices. And officers were folding to their pressure because they were afraid of these officers. And so the idea of communication, there were citizens who started reporting this to um, city leaders, to the police chief, to higher ups in the police department, and everyone just turned a blind, a blind eye to it. And so it just continued and it proliferated. And it became so bad that now the Department of Justice is in looking at the situation, but it went back to these officers. On the heels of that, I was brought into another um, situation involving a much larger department and the situation was almost identical. The department had had a very concerted effort to increase their recruitment and targeted veterans. They wanted vets on the police force and sure enough the new recruiting class um, became the same kind of model in this agency and it led to a, a lot of very bad things that happened, not quite as severe as the first example. But again, going back to communication, there was a lot of communication. There was a lot of whistleblowing in those circumstances, notwithstanding the, the thin blue line and the code of silence, but nobody did anything. Nobody would step up to the plate. So I don't think there's one thing that's necessarily the answer. At the end of the day, it's going to be some combination of all of it, but it's going to take attent attention to the details and um, diligence. I think we're going to have to be diligent, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be something that takes, takes some time. Well, I, well, I'm just thinking on that, you know, it's... Okay. It's a cultural thing, you know, it's the, within the military we created, you know, when I, I first got to Afghanistan, I was actually kind of surprised how docile and how sort of calm the prison was when I first got there. 
it was run by, did I, I don't know if I mentioned this, it was run by a North Carolina MP unit. First day we're there, the NCOIC pulled us aside, pulled all the interrogators and said, listen, I'm in charge of this place. If you want to talk to a detainee, you have to go through me. He goes, you don't put your hands on any of these people? He goes, if I see you putting hands on them, you know, even just to put your shoulder on to guide them when you're walking them to the booth, he goes, I'll report you. He goes, only my MPs will touch the detainees. He goes, if you see my detainee, my MPs harming a detainee, he goes, you tell me, I'll take care of it. This unit was completely professional. They, were, they set up the prison in Kandahar in December of 01. They set up the prison at Bagram in early 02. September 02, they left. Same time I left. They were replaced by an Ohio National Guard MP unit. They had two weeks together, and I was there for that two weeks. These guys were completely different. They were analogous to the, the Abu Ghraib guys. They, they were poorly trained. It came out later that they were trained by civilian correctional officers, and they were trained to use force and to use blunt instruments to, to suppress people. And what happened was, before the end of 2002, within their first two months there, they killed two detainees that you probably read about, the two Afghans. One was a taxi driver had no terrorist link at all. The other one was probably maybe Taliban, but you know, not much of a threat at all. And they, they, they murdered them, and they, were, and they were just applying the techniques that they learned. But again, it goes back to the, they were completely unprofessional, and they, they weren't trained correctly according to the military MP standards, but the first unit was. They were completely professional. Not, there were no allegations of abuse during that first eight, nine months that we were in Afghanistan. Now, fast forward, they were, reserve, they were a National Guard unit, the first unit. They went home. For a few months, the Iraq War started. They were activated again. Now, this is an MP unit that started from scratch the detainee facilities in Afghanistan, so you would, with no allegations of abuse. So you, and the Red Cross was there, you know, overseeing this whole thing. So you would think it would be natural for them to be utilized in Iraq, right? No, they spent eight months at Fort Dix, New Jersey, while the other units went over to, and set up Abu Ghraib, and we know what happened there. So again, you know, there's, there's this whole meme and this whole fallacy that, you know, certainly there was a lack of training and there's a lack of professionalism, and we need professionalism, but it wasn't just the troops at the lower level. It was the people at the very top that made really poor decisions that, that facilitated a lot of this would happen. You know, and, and the good thing is, you know, like the torture memos, the torture memos have been rescinded by the Justice Department. Um, you know, Barack Obama claims that we don't torture anymore, they're going to close Gitmo, but obviously that hasn't happened yet. There have been some steps in the right direction, but I still think there's still that culture, and there's the culture that we talk about. And until we change the culture, you're not going to change anything. Because we talk about the images, right? So we'll show people, you'll see the images of Abu Ghraib, and we're all you know, shocked by them and we're appalled by them and we say, well, that doesn't represent us, right? All of us, any of us. But at the same time, if you put those images next to the World Trade Towers going down, what's going to be more influential to people? This is a personal war to people. Even the people who lived, you know, here, you know, it's very personal. So people can, I think, easily dismiss, well, you know, the torture is justified or that maltreatment is justified, or letting them rot in Gitmo is justified because these guys knocked down these buildings. Right? And I don't know how we change that. All right. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to keep on schedule. I know um, maybe uh, for our last speech, our, our last closing comments, we'll move with the way forward in, in some concepts of resolution. <laughs> so we'll leave it to our philosopher to, to bring that, because we know philosophers bring so much closure for these types of things. So uh, thank you all very much for attending, and Dr. French. <clears throat> yes, I was trying to interrupt him just because I was thinking, gosh, don't oversell it. I get, <laughs> I'm not going to solve all these problems for you right here. And I also know that it's the end of a long day, and I, I do want to be brief so that uh, uh, we could all uh, um, rest and think over these important issues that, that we've raised. One thing I did want to say, and, and uh, this is uh, not precisely my closing remarks, but, but perhaps to throw a ray of hope uh, from your comments about, uh, and the other uh, uh, 
responses about the concern uh, that uh, we may be you know, sort of handing over our values to our enemies by saying that we will you know, change our values depending on who it is that we're fighting. Uh, the ray of hope is that um, at the service academies right now, uh, we do teach uh, about uh, the code of the warrior. We do teach about the basic principle uh, that uh, that code has to come from your core values and it should not adapt based on, on the circumstances or the person that you are fighting and that it actually has no meaning if it's susceptible to that. And we talk about uh, the, um, it's a whole other discussion, but we talk about uh, why, you, why our warriors need that code and, uh, and the importance of that. So I, I, I urge you to take some solace in the fact that we are addressing that point, and it is a cultural issue, but, but it is one that is, is not being ignored, at least at the officer level. Uh, they're greater concern per perhaps uh, as to whether we're doing a good enough job uh, sending that message broadly uh, across uh, all military ranks and, and all services, but uh, it is out there, and it is in the conversation. What I did want to say to, to try to just at least draw some of these threads together so that we can all continue to reflect on them in a productive way is that, um, you know, there's a, I am a philosopher, so I'm going to bring in a, a philosophical concept. There's a concept you find in the, uh, the uh, writings, uh, the ethics of Immanuel Kant, that is the idea of moral harmony. And uh, while I'm uh, very in favor of a lot of Kantian ethics, uh, this is one aspect that I have not found um, one that I can reconcile with that's very palatable. Uh, and it, it's basically the idea uh, that there are no real conflicts of duty, that if you understand circumstances correctly, there will always be a way to find the harmony, to, to determine what takes priority. And the reason that that's never really sat well with me is that um, I guess I come more from the Greek school, and uh, I believe in moral tragedy. I think there are genuine cases where you cannot uh, answer all of the obligations uh, that are placed before you, that in order to do one, you must uh, compromise or abandon another. Uh, thankfully, I think these are not all of that frequent, and I do think there's a danger of people thinking they occur more than they do when there are cases that you could, in fact, resolve. But I think we have to acknowledge, or I would urge acknowledging, uh, in, in light of all the, that we heard today, that sometimes people are in fact placed in impossible no-win situations. Um, now, the, the better news is that what we have also heard today are many examples <clears throat> of people being placed not quite in impossible, but just, just, <laughs> in very unfair, extremely difficult situations. And I think those we can address and should address. Uh, and, and I should also note, as many of our speakers have, that we've also heard encouraging examples of uh, people finding a way to navigate those difficult waters and, in fact, um, finding a way to do the right thing, although, unfortunately, not always without cost to themselves. <clears throat> and we, we've seen, I think, through this day, that the idea of divided loyalties is not a myth, but where the real conflicts reside uh, is not always immediately apparent, that uh, some of the assumptions that we might have come in with about where the exact conflicts are uh, may have, have, have uh, um, uh, been dispelled from hearing the examples, and, and yet there are true conflicts. The overall theme that we've heard um, is that good people are not being given what they need, that they are being spread too thin, too much is being asked of them, there's a lack of appropriate training or guidance, and mission creep, and I guess what I would call the three C's keep coming up, compromise, compartmentalization, and culture. <laughs> and those three came up a lot in our conversations. So I certainly don't have all the answers, but I, I, I think we've heard some suggestions of, or whispers of answers that I did want to just bring out for us. So what do we need to do in order to push for a way to help these people, these good people who are trying to navigate these difficult waters. And I'm, I'm going to suggest five things have come through in, in, our, um, in the wisdom of our speakers that we've had today. One is that we need more clearly defined roles. I think that was something that was evident in a lot of the conversations that um, 
Some of these divided loyalties have occurred because the roles themselves are not clear. And to the degree that we can clarify those roles, uh, we can uh, help people out of some of, the, some of these difficulties. Another theme, which we certainly just heard again loud and clear, is the need for greater transparency. Uh, unfortunately, as was also highlighted, a lot of the spheres in which we're, um, uh, in which we're looking today are ones where transparency is an uncomfortable notion, uh, where secrecy, uh, for one reason or another, has become the norm. And in some cases, it is because of the need uh, for trust, the need for the close and intimate bond of having one another's back. Uh, but uh, I, I still believe that uh, letting the sunshine in is, is part of the solution. So we have to find ways to encourage transparency and dispel the idea that it is a threat to trust and, in fact, suggest it can increase trust. The third point, which I think we uh, have heard again uh, and again today, is the need for checks and balances, that where the power is, is uh, not spread around and there's no way for... Uh, uh, one group's uh, power to be checked by another, you have the greater chance of corruption and more likely of people feeling that they have no way out, that they have no way to be a whistleblower safely, uh, that they have no way to uh, seek another authority. In the, in the Milgram experiment, experiments, as you heard about this morning, um, in uh, one of the variations, <clears throat> there is a case where two authorities disagree and um, I just want to remind you of that because that, there's a wonderful bit of hope in that as well. Uh, because when the, the authorities disagree, the people who are asked to do the shocking immediately back off. And they wait until the authorities agree with one another. Now what's encouraging about that is that the more authorities we can uh, place into some of these situations who have legitimate uh, ways to counterpoint one another, the more chance there is that that disagreement might occur to at least just press the pause button for a moment and give people uh, time to stop and say, wait, now, should we really be doing this? If you have only one authority and they're giving a consistent message, it's very hard to rebel against that. But if you have at least another authority that's a check on that saying, wait, you know, I'm not so sure. I, I'm, I need us to stay, take a step back, uh, then it, it, it can be uh, an opportunity for uh, the person who is in the inferior role or the, uh, the person who feels powerless previously to step up. Another point that, uh, again, was raised frequently, the fourth point, is uh, that we need clear and robust doctrine. Uh, now, this is work for some of you in this room. <laughs> I am a mere philosopher. I do not write law. I do not write doctrine. We can encourage some things. But uh, so uh, those of you who are interested <clears throat> in uh, these issues that were raised today, I encourage you to uh, take seriously this, this mission and uh, see if we can't encourage uh, more uh, clarity and uh, spelling out some of the doctrines involved here in order to prevent some of the mission creep and, and so forth that's gone on. Now, the final, the fifth point that I will make is the largest one uh, and uh, is biting off rather a lot, but I think it has to be said. And that is that uh, if we want to uh, prevent some of these um, moral tragedies that I was referring to or at least help some of the good people navigate a little more easily the difficult challenges of conflicts of duty, we need to stop the corruption and corrosion of core values at the top. This is an issue of command climate, in the, to use the military uh, language. The idea is that if you start to erode these values from the top and you start to say, well, maybe we do torture, maybe we do um, bend the rules, break, break the rules here, maybe we are comfortable with this or that slippage away from, from uh, what the Constitution actually says. If we allow those kinds of um, core value uh, erosions to occur, what happens is we then place the people lower down in the ranks into these impossible situations that they would not otherwise be. I mean, look at what we've heard today. How many of the cases that we heard today would not have even arisen uh, if people were not asked to do things like torture, if they were not asked uh, to um, prosecute on uh, using uh, co uh, coercive evidence? Uh, if, if they were not asked to uh, violate uh, the, the, the principles that they were originally brought on board to, to support. So we have to address 
the command climate issue and hold our leaderships uh, to our leaders and, and our leadership to higher standards and insist on consistency of values at the top because that trickles down to the lower ranks not knowing what to do because they cannot count on there being a consistent message above them. So that is on all of us, uh, whatever our profession, to hold our leaders to that standard. So I will close by making uh, the point that was made at least twice uh, by two of our speakers uh, that it is very dangerous to say things like, this is a new kind of war. Here to tell you something I suspect you all know, there is nothing new under the sun and certainly not new kinds of war because we humans have been killing each other quite effectively for a very long time and we have figured out every which way to do it. Some of the technology may change, but the basic principles have not. And uh, that is something that Kant did get quite, quite right, which is we should be suspicious, very suspicious, whenever exceptions are made to core principles based on contingencies. It's, it, anytime you hear, well, in this case, for this person, under these circumstances, with these kinds of enemies, we're going to adapt this core principle, be very, very suspicious, because uh, that th there is seldom uh, a, a good and, and uh, consistent way to defend those kinds of exceptions. So I think that should set off the biggest red flag or alarm buzzer uh, for each of us, and, and we can try to be vigilant on that point. So thank you, and uh, thank you all for your attention. All right, thank you all very much for attending. Um, one of the things that has been an operating theme as we have put this symposium together is a, a story that I'll, I'll briefly relay um, has been with me as, trying to figure out this way to move forward. Um, there was a young medical corpsman who was serving at Abu Ghraib um, before the, uh, the photos were disclosed and was dealing with this. And, and I've kept this young corpsman in mind as we've tried to figure out what this is about because the young corpsman had become a corpsman because he was not a pacifist, was not opposed to war, but was a, opposed to him being involved directly in the killing and so selected to become a corpsman to provide care and comfort to both U.S. and, and other people who were injured, whether in conflict or during the service. And this dilemma that this young man faced when he got to Abu Ghraib, when he was put into these open tents where lots of the, the Afghan uh, fighters were, or, or whoever they were, Taliban or other fighters, and was given direct orders that he was not to exercise his trade and training as corpsman to provide care and comfort to fix the people who had been injured and wounded in conflict or, or even were just sick from malnutrition in other environments, and rather was told that his obligation and his duty was to keep them alive barely so that they would be softened up for the interrogation that was going to come forward. And as we've gone through today and as we've talked about what this is supposed to do for the way forward, I think if we keep that young corpsman in mind about how we're supposed to tell him what he is supposed to do, is he supposed to issue the shock or is he not? We have to figure out a way to tell our service people that it is in fact okay to not give that shock so that that young corpsman does what he's been trained to do and then doesn't come back and, and to tell you where he is today, he is a terribly broken person because of the things that he did when he was at Abu Ghraib. So with that happy note, <laughs> um, thank you all very much for attending. I hope this was useful for those of you who are here and for those watching on the web. Um, and thank you very much. Have a good weekend. <laughs>